MLS year five for you here in Arkansas, and this is I was I did a piece the other day about your roster having 35 years of Division One experience, seven transfers the most you've had since coming here. Will you talk a little bit about the vast difference between last year and a young team and maybe one that's a more veteran experience and how that even impacts practices and how you plan? Yeah, I think every year is different. Um, you know, it's really helped um, to have, um, you know, the returners back, uh, meaning Devo and, and Jalen Graham and, um, you know, Cade and, and Lawson and, and uh, Joseph. It's, it's, it's helped to, ha you know, we have a little bit more returners than we've had. And then obviously uh, with the experience um, that we have with guys like L. Ellis and, and uh, you know, Davenport and, um, you know, Brazil's helped a lot on the side. He still hasn't jumped in with us full go. Um, but, but having returners along with veterans that have played a lot of college basketball games, um, T. Mark comes from a great program at Houston. Um, so, you know, like you get a guy like T. Mark who's played – uh, for such a great coach and Calvin Sampson. He understands how to work hard. He understands expectations. Um, so I think that's, you know, it's, a, it's, it's, it's different. Um, you know, with, with experience, you know, you can do things a little bit differently. And then with some, you know, we have more returners than we did in the, in the past as well. So we've been able to accelerate uh, some of our schemes. Um, but, you know, there's no comparison ever of, of really teams other than the fact that, you know, what can this group uh, execute and then move on to the next step or maybe a, a, a different phase. We've, we've, we've got in a lot more right now than we have in the past um, four years. And I think it, it's, it's, a, it's a combination of a whole bunch of things. Eric, I remember last year you were saying that you were having to repeat yourself a lot with that young group. Is there less of that kind of with the teaching aspect of summer? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, when I come home at night, you know, <laughs> I mean, I tell Danielle all the time, like, it's, um, you know, I, I, there's not, there's not any, there's not as much coaching frustration, um, you know, that's, it's, it's, it, in reality, you know, I, we've had one bad, you know, we've had one bad practice, I thought, the whole summer. Um, and then we've had a couple that, you know, we'd like the energy a little bit better. But I would say, you know, for the most part, and again, we're doing, you know, we're doing execution. We're doing teaching. We're doing um, five-on-zero oh, skeleton dry run type stuff. Um, you know, we have, you know, no way, shape, or form have we even come close to a rotation. Uh, roles are being formulated in the coaching staff and probably in the players minds i'm sure that you know the players are are forming opinions of teammates and forming maybe who they trust or formulating who could be a go-to guy and i use that term very loosely like who could be because uh, that's going to all evolve and develop and uh, you know we hope to you know whoever we are in november we hope that just like in the past that we're much different come march and that could be Rotation player-wise, it could be set play. I mean, we you know we still have a lot to try to figure out, but it's been a really good, a really good summer um, as far as working. Our mile times, you know, much improved off um, you know the last four years, um, and then you know it's it's similar approach and uh, adding type stuff that we had you know with with. With, with our last year at Nevada, I would say. I know you guys have been limited in what you can do over the summer. I'm just curious of, of maybe your overall takeaways. Are there certain things about this group that have, have really stood out to you that you like or maybe any areas you've identified that, that you need to work on going into the fall? Really coachable group. Um, and I'll give you an example. L. Ellis was, was, uh, was really quiet. Um, you know, did his own, you know, did, you know, was was doing what he should do as an individual. Um, I don't know if I've seen a player change so quickly in his uh, leadership, his verbal uh, command of the floor, 
uh, been really cool to see in a very short period of time. And then, and then the other guy, like Jalen Graham's practice habits are dramatically different than last year, dramatically. He's done an incredible job um, of understanding expectations and then following through on his part. Um, so there's been some, some, some evolving even this summer, but that's been, that's been one thing, Curtis, it's, it's really been, been cool to see is, is Graham's you know, evolution and, 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 uh, and how L has, has really picked up what our expectations are and how we try to uh, conduct practice and, and uh, you know, how talking and verbalization is really important on the court for us. And we've, we've already talked a lot about the, the veterans on the group. Uh, just, just curious what you've seen from your freshmen, Layden and Bay, so far and how they've kind of acclimated themselves to the team. Yep, great question. I mean, Bay, is, Bay got here a little bit later than some of the other guys. He's, he's a, a very, very hard worker, um, spends a lot of time on his own. Um, surprising he can make threes, you know, um, at a much higher clip. Got to continue to work on hands. Catching the ball in traffic is, is an area that we want to continue to, uh, to work with him on. Um, you know, and he's, he's going to, you know, because he's a freshman, he's going to play a little bit catch up uh, on understanding as we um, add stuff. Um, and again, he came late. So I think anybody that doesn't, you know, isn't here when, when some of the foundation stuff has been put in, you're, you're playing catch up and certainly, um, you know, he falls into that. And then, you know, Layden, is a, he's got a very mature approach uh, to how he conducts. Um, I don't know if I've been around, you know, a player his age who comes in pre-practice and get, goes into the weight room and starts stretching um, and getting himself mentally ready to, pl pr to practice, not play, but to practice. Um, so he's, got a, he's, he's mature beyond what his age is and, and he's a good leader on the floor and he's got point guard characteristics for sure. You've had a lot of, I guess, non-traditional lead guards in your time at Arkansas with you know Jimmy Witt, Jalen Tate, and even Anthony Black last year. With L. Ellis, how would you compare and contrast his skill set and kind of what he brings to the table as a potential point guard for you? Yeah, I mean, I think when when we look at you know Jalen Tate and uh, Jimmy Witt and and, uh, and and Anthony Black, I mean, those guys were, you know, they were freaks from a length and a size standpoint. Cody Martin at Nevada, Lindsey Drew at Nevada, those guys are. You know they're they're six six with seven foot wingspans that guard the one and a half guys every possession just because of their length. So we're a little bit different, you know, this year um, when L's out there and when Layden's out there. Um, but but we're also a little bit different because they're they have a little bit more traditional point guard mentality of 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 some things that we won as well. So. Um, you know, probably not going to defensive rebound as well as we as we have in the past at that position because, you know, Anthony Black's one of the best defensive rebounders in college basketball. Jimmy Witt was was incredible, uh, rebounded the ball. Tate was, you know, great at it as well. So, we're you know we're a little different in that aspect. Um, and and L's been traditionally a score a scoring guard. Um, who's played the point? We're gonna we're gonna want him to continue to score, but also to be a little bit more of a facilitator than maybe what he has been able to show um, last year. And with Keon Minifield, obviously you'd rather have him this year ready to play. But just is the plan with him maybe to have him on the JD Note track? You know, I know the redshirt year was very important for his development. Yeah, I think one of the one of the uh, non benefits of the way the transfer portal is right now I've you know I, as I look back at at the transfers that we've had that have sat out and I'll you know I'll use Cody and Caleb Martin as an example um, I thought it was the best thing for their the longevity of their career and that's proven the case with how they're playing at the NBA level um, you know Keon um, super super talented um, you know Pat Eckerman who was on staff here and um, he watched our practice, you know, and, and just, you know, talked about, wow, you know, he's special talent, you know, and, and um, you know, that's, that's what the year's got to be about is how, how can he get better. 
Um, how can he gain weight? How can he gain strength? Um, certainly, we got a pretty good player on, on scout team. Eric, I know you like these big preseason exhibition games. I'm just curious how that Purdue exhibition game came about. Do you have a connection with, which, with Coach Painter? Uh, the only connection really with Coach Painter is just, uh, you know, Nike puts on a on an event with with a certain group of coaches and so I've been a part of that with him um, and his wife and Danielle you know but but nothing you know substantial other than the fact that from afar you know you're talking about one of the premier programs uh, in the country you're talking about you know when we met about as a, as a staff it was how can we play uh, a top three team in the nation who would be willing to play us and how could we possibly do that in front of our home fans because last year we played Texas who was a top 10 team for most of the year how could we get a team in Bud Walton um, and Todd Lee uh, you know did a great job of of working the uh, exhibition game for us and and then doing that with administration and and Purdue's administration. I think it's going to be a great game uh, for Purdue, for Arkansas, for our fan base um, as well. Because it's, it's, I mean, you're going, to, you're going to be able to get a Big Ten team in here that I'm going to assume comes in anywhere from one to three. And they're really unique. They have incredible shooters. They were young last year. They have a, a player that could be player of the year in college basketball who's overly unique in how you have to prepare for him. So I think it gives us a lot of a lot of really great things. And we referenced our Texas game even as we got ready for the NCAA tournament about things Texas did, about physicality. Um, so hopefully this game this is this is a game that we're gonna be able to reference throughout the course of the season as well. Coach, uh, you mentioned some of the, the practice habits that have been impressive, but when you think about the transfers, is there any one player or one specific you know, basketball skill from them that's really stood out and surprised you so far in summer workouts? You know, I think that when you, when you go and, and, you, and you get into the transfer portal, I think that you, know, you try to study a player analytically. You try to study how he did in league play. Um, you try to study how he played against you know, top 20 teams. You try to figure out, you know, what a guy can do in clutch situations. So I think we've, you know, we've studied our, the guys that, that we've gotten um, or even the guys that we maybe missed on and, and, and didn't get. I think we, you know, there shouldn't be a lot of surprises with the transfer due to the fact that you're able to evaluate that player in Division One level. Um, so I don't know if there's been any real surprises. I mean, we have been, um, you know, we've been banged up. Um, you know, we've we've uh, we've had a lot of guys on the side that that are that'll all be, for the most part, every when we come back. I mean, we have one more one more practice tomorrow, and uh, when we come back, we should be a, a team that's that's fully healthy, and there's no reason to go into you know who was hurt. It's it's irrelevant because. Um, you know, we're doing everything behind closed doors. And when we come back, um, you know, other than, other than the timeline of, of, of Brazil will be a little bit different than some of our other guys because, you know, we are being overly, um, you know, precautious with him and want to make sure that we, we hit that nine-month uh, mark before he, uh, you know, does a whole lot. the ACC SEC challenge just what does it say about where your program is to get those two teams coming into Bud Walton yeah well I think one Purdue you know that game in particular like they had a choice of probably doing that game with a lot of people um, and I think that you know coach Painter and his staff understand that um, you know Bud Walton is a unique place to play and and, and I'm really hopeful that our I'm hopeful that our fans across the state understand the significance of getting a team like this for an exhibition because there's not a lot of exhibition games that are being played <laughs> against Division One 
teams. And so we're doing something unique. We're doing something that, you know, I mean, you're putting it all out there really quickly. <laughs> you know, you're, you're auditioning in front of a lot of people. Um, you know, it's, it's, there's a little bit more um, opinions are going to be formed during that game, after that game, than if you play a Division II team. So uh, credit to Purdue for being willing to play a road game. Credit to them to be, able to be willing to play a, you know, a quality opponent. And same thing from us. Like we, they've proven a lot more than we have with, with who they have coming back. So, um, and then the Duke game. Um, look, Bud Walton was going to be sold out, you know, regardless of what our schedule looked like across the board. Um, but the, the four years that I've been here, I would anticipate that, uh, that the Duke game is, is going to be like, you know, when we played Kentucky and when we played Auburn and they've been ranked very high. Um, I know that uh, the requests, you know, that I've gotten uh, from friends. I, ta I was talking to Phil Nevin last night, um, the Angels manager. He's coming to that game. Like, there's a lot of people that want to come to that particular game, too, which is you look at our schedule with the three Bahama games um, at the Battle of Atlantis, and then you look at, you know, Oklahoma, and you look at uh, Duke. That's going to be as five challenging games as this program's ever played. Um, non-conference and uh, you know it'll it'll we'll figure out ways to get better after playing those five games too because we're going to find some holes in our team for sure um, with a lot of new guys playing that quality opponent we know Duke will come in here one two or three as well so um, between the Purdue game and and the Duke game we'll probably play two of the top three teams in the country in, in a Four weeks. Yeah. Kentucky staying with schedule uh, home away for a back to back season. It's only going to be the third time since Arkansas has been in the SEC. Has there anything come from How the league? How many times has it been since I've been here? Twice, two out of right. But I mean, it, I always thought that th those are two of your premier programs in the league. Why weren't they playing more home and away? Did you get anything from the office other than here's the schedule? Do you know why they're leaning into that? We just get the schedule. Okay. Um, you know, but. I mean, certainly, you know, with, with Coach Cal and his program, I mean, it's, it's uh, like what they experience as a team every year. They go into everybody's building. You know, it's sold out. Um, it's a game that's circled right away. Um, you know, for us, if you look at our road attendance, you know, I have not studied the numbers, but, but probably should. I'd love to know what our road attendance is this year because we went in a lot of buildings that were sold out too. Um, and and uh, with each passing year, again, I don't have the numbers, and I could, <laughs> I could definitely be way off. Um, but if I had to guess, our road attendance numbers have have probably increased as well. Okay, and a follow up. You don't have to go to Knoxville, I think, for the first time since you've been here this year. They come in, and have you considered now getting a timeshare in Tuscaloosa? The schedule seems to send Arkansas to Bama lately, and now you get Tennessee. Yeah, and I think that. Um, you know, every uh, coach, every program has their own philosophy on things. But uh, your question, Kevin, is, 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 you know, in the NBA, it's an 82-game schedule. And you, you play everybody equal, right? You play your conference a certain amount of games. You play the other conference home and away. Um, at Nevada, um, we had a balanced schedule. So winning the league carried a lot of weight. Um, when you have an imbalanced schedule, uh, <laughs> strength of schedule matters. And who you play and where you play them and what time of the year you play them matters. So um, we had a much higher goal at, at Nevada to win, the, to win the conference based on how the schedule was set up. Here, I don't know how you determine who – it's really hard to determine who the best team is um, because not everybody's schedule's equal. And, and so, um, like, our goal is how do we get better in March? How do we advance in the tournament? 
that's that's always going to be our goal because of what of what you said. I mean, um, you know, I can tell you a lot of restaurants um, in certain cities, and then there's other cities in our league that I have no idea of one restaurant um, based on how often or how little we've visited them. This is the first time we've been able to talk to you since the board approved those Bud Walton renovations. I was just curious your thoughts. I mean, it's way over my, you know, deal. But uh, I mean, obviously, I think anytime there's going to be renovations with anything, you know, you're excited, and, and um, you know, I know that there'll be a lot of conversations on, you know, what it will look like, and uh, I probably won't. Be Unless they ask about the locker room. <laughs> um, I think whatever you know, they come to is going to be awesome for the program and great for the fan base. And, and um, so, you know, this the, the game of college basketball is, is 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 changing. It's becoming way more entertainment. Um, part of that's you know having your building be the place to be, so that um, you don't. You know, you don't, you don't just want to cater to basketball fans. You need to, like, cater to, you know, people that don't necessarily love basketball. And you do that by having amenities in an arena. Like, that's some of the – that's what makes pro sports different is how they market um, and get people to come to their games uh, that aren't coming just for, the, just for the ball and the two hoops. They're coming to – a place to be, it's fun environment, it's entertain, you know, all those things. And, and certainly uh, having a building be rented, I think it can certainly add to that tremendously. You mentioned the Oklahoma game. How did that game kind of get back on the schedule if it wasn't? Uh, what went into that? Well, I read, you know, that at one point Hunter said it was off, and I thought it was off too. Um, you know, it was it was discussed. You know, possibly playing it in Oklahoma City. Um, it was discussed: Are we going to do it or not do it in Tulsa? I think it's great for Oklahoma, I think it's great for, for Arkansas. I think it's great for the Sooners fan base. I think it's great for the Razorback fan base. I think it's great for Porter Mosier. I think it's great for our staff. So, um, the environment there. Um, any fans that haven't been there for either program, I think it's a great game. It gives you a, a different feel than our own building, uh, much like the Little Rock game does. It's 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 really cool. It, it's uh, you know if you play double digit games in 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 Bud Walton, then you get an opportunity to go play a game, and it's it 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 helps us prepare for the NCAA tournament. I can tell you that to to you know obviously you go to Little Rock, and it's a you know. It's all 100% Razorback fans, but still, it's a different environment that we have to adjust to, which I think helps prepare our basketball team. From a fan base standpoint, it's great as well. Going to Tulsa, jumping on a bus, going, staying in a it's different than playing a game uh, in this building. It is a neutral site game, so I think that's, a, that's an awesome game for us, too, on the schedule. Coach, with Tremont and Jeremiah, has anything in particular stood out to you about those guys this summer, and where do you think they can maybe best help you? Yep, so um, T. Mark is a – I mean, you're talking about a guy that started on a team that uh, was ranked number one for most of the year. Um, so that alone speaks volumes. Uh, Houston, one of the toughest teams physically, uh, one of the best defensive teams every year. Uh, one of the most disciplined coaches. So T. Mark got all of that. Um, I think he's a, a very underrated offensive player from the way that he's improved his game uh, in, in a short few months. Um, I think he's a, a player that uh, defensively, uh, him and, and Devontae Devo Davis together um, are going to be really good. Um, Devo has taken on the challenge, even as a freshman, to guard the opposing team's best player, regardless of that pl if that player plays the one, two, or the three. And oftentimes, Devo's assigned to to the power forward if need be. And now, uh, 
you know, he's got another partner um, to, to, to try to, you know, contend. It's really hard, man. When you assign a guy the best player on the other team and he's holding that guy under his average – and the bulk of the plays are run at you, and you're fighting off screens. You're on an island on isolations. What Devo's done defensively is insane. Um, I mean, he really only had one game last year where I felt like the offensive player, I mean, that means he won 29 battles, and he was basically 29-1 and one in his individual matchups. And I think that T. Mark can do the same thing for us, which, you know, let's face it, in college basketball, Premier scores are usually the, the point guard, off guard, or small forward, um, with the exception of certain teams, you know, where Mississippi State's going to throw the ball into Tulu Smith, and, and, and you got a big that, but for the most part, um, if you generalized one, two, and three, and now we got two guys that play uh, two of those three positions that are incredible defenders from an individual standpoint. And then Davenport really shoot the basketball, got great range. Uh, can play the three, can, if we want to go small ball, can play some four. Um, you know, so he's given us a, a stretch the floor type player that we look at our numbers we obviously needed. Must uh, going back to recru kind of recruiting but the five returnees, how important, it kind of gets overlooked, retention. I mean, I consider Brazil and D Devo book in five-star recruiting prizes when you look at it from a retention standpoint can you talk about how that's helped the whole thing internally when you do bring in a total of nine newcomers even with five returnees yeah I mean I think if you look at um, college football if you look at uh, college baseball if you look at um, college basketball there's a lot of um, starters there's a lot of top three scores off teams in power five that are transferring you know, we have not had that. Um, you know, J.D. Note, you know, he elected to go pro um, a year before his eligibility, but he did not elect to transfer and leave Arkansas. Um, Adis Tony um, elected to go pro with a year of eligibility, but he did not transfer. So we have not had um, anybody, you know, walk into my office at the end of the year like a TB or a Devo and decide that somewhere else, you know, um, and we've been very, very lucky from that, from that aspect to not have a starter um, that's a top two player or top, because it happens in, in, in every sport. And so the, the impact, Kevin, that those guys have for us right now, words can't describe, you know, TB's on the side coaching players and, and, and Devo, I said our team had one bad practice. Devo's had one bad practice all year. That's a lot of practices with only, you know, over you go eight out of your ten weeks and, and he had one bad practice. And was, I'm assuming that bad practice we had a team was probably the one that he had a bad practice. Um, so having those guys back, even Cade and, and, and Lawson, like those guys are, it's, it, it has a big impact when you try to demonstrate something and you have players jump out there and demonstrate it. It just it changes your culture. Um, and all, all the guys that are, you know, same with Joseph. Like, I mean, he knows exactly what we want and he can go out and show, verbalize, and show just by doing what, what's asked of him. Before you, Mike rushes me off, anybody else got anything? Or are we good? We're good? All right, Mike, you, good timing. <laughs>